Um, within the last, next hour, I would like to talk a little bit about um, media freedom or freedom of expression on the internet and this funny UN Internet Governance Forum, how this came about, um, what's the status quo at the moment, and what possible perspectives might be for this IGF, this Internet Governance Forum, uh, in the future. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here as a visiting scholar this fall semester or part of the fall semester and to give this talk. And in the beginning, I would like to um, talk a little bit about freedom of expression um, and why I came to, to look into this topic a little more. Um, as you heard, I was working long titles on my previous jobs. So it's long, the OSCE, Representative on Freedom of the Media, it's a governmental institution. The OSCE is made up of 57 countries, and they have this office, the Representative on Freedom of the Media, who is looking into um, the situation of journalists, media regulation, censorship, and limits to freedom of expression in all those 57 countries. I was working there for <coughs> seven years from 2002 on, and one of my jobs there was also looking into freedom of expression on the internet. Um, it used to be different times then. When, when I started there, one of my colleagues asked me whether I knew how to Google, so <laughs> that that was already a skill back then that, that wasn't commonly known, apparently. Um, well, I was, and, and one of my jobs was looking into, into the rise of the internet and limits to freedom of expression. We organized a couple of conferences there um, together with um, other international organizations, United Nations, UNESCO, uh, with a lot bilateral with uh, some of the OECE countries, and also with industry and um, companies that are active in, in this regard. Um, so it used to be different times. There was no Facebook, no Twitter uh, back then. Um, Wi-Fi was something that was rarely happening in the OSCE region. But still, we knew um, two things um, already back then. One was that the internet would be changing the way everybody would be expressing themselves in the future and the way that media would work in the future. And the other one was that the internet isn't immune to censorship. There is this famous saying by John Gilmore one of the founders of the Usenet, a technician, who said, the net interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. Um, while that might be true for the technical infrastructure of the internet, as we can see today, it's not true. It ho doesn't hold true for the internet as such. Because the internet is not only made up of these technical components, but there is policy issues to it. There is, there is laws. There is regulation. Um, there is technology that, that evolved um, from back then. So. Taking a look at possible limits of freedom of expression on the internet. So isn't everybody free to express themselves there? I think there is a couple, or, or history shows that there is a couple of different limits to freedom of expression. And I just have some, some examples here. Um, the first one is that censorship on the internet sometimes is surprisingly analog. So there is bloggers are arrested, journalists are harassed, Offices are sealed, um, newsrooms are searched, computers are seized. So all the um, uh, methods of censorship in the offline world can also be applied to the online world. Plus, of course, with the technical development um, going on, um, there are a couple of more legal and technical issues um, that at least potentially can limit freedom of expression online. Um, licensing and hosting requirements are some of these legal uh, particularities in some countries that limit freedom of expression. It's not the case in Germany, it certainly isn't the case in the US, but there are countries where you need to have a license in order to start your online media. Or countries where it's required to have the hosting of your sites within the country, in Kazakhstan for example. So if you have content on the .kz domain in Kazakhstan, it needs to be hosted in the country, not somewhere on Google servers or something, which of course makes it easier for the government to shut it down once they, they don't like it anymore. We have seen blocking and filtering of internet content within countries, across borders. Um, we have seen tampering with the DNS, with the domain name system, um, to, to prevent people from accessing uh, 
content on the internet. Um, last week, Sean Powers was here and was talking about intranets on the internet and the Great Firewall of China. So these are examples of uh, blocking, filtering, and DNS tampering. Um, there are other technological developments that might also potentially have impacts on the way we use the internet. IPv6, for example, is just on the technical level enabling more devices to be connected to the internet. Those IP numbers, we run out of IP numbers now that every fridge has its own internet access, we run out of IP numbers and IPv6 is just um, uh, enlarging this, this domain space, which is good, but it might be, or some, some civil society organizations fear, um, that with IPv6 you get an IP address or your device gets an IP address that stays the same wherever you are. So as long as you use the device, you can be identified as the user or as the device wherever you uh, move on the internet. So that might have some privacy um, components to it. Top-level domains. You all know those top-level domains like .com um, or country top-level domains .fr for France, .de for Germany, and the like, um, which are uh, basically allocated by ICANN. This funny institution. We'll talk a little bit about ICANN in a, in a moment. Um, but there's also controversies about these top-level <coughs> domains. Um, there was a discussion, for example, about um, .cat for Catalonia. Catalonia is one of those semi-autonomous or, or secessionist or whatever point of view you want to take regions in Spain. And they wanted to have their own top-level domain as a country. So suddenly, technical issues are not technical anymore, but they become policy issues. They become governance issues. SIM is another top-level domain for Wales. So they wanted to have their own domain, which was given to the Cayman Islands then. So they are lobbying for another top-level domain now. And um, it shows in different, different um, uh, negotiations, too. Um, the European Commission, for example, just at the moment has a problem with the top-level domain .wine because of trademark reasons. American companies would love to have dot wine to, to announce or to, to, to uh, uh, advertise their wines there. The European Commission and f most of all France has a problem with this. So it's, it's policy issues, it's copyright issues, and, and what seems to be <laughs> it's French issues, it's wine issues um, when it comes to these top-level domains and the governance of them. Um, nationalization of the internet. Also last week, Sean Powers was talking about these intranets. I just mentioned them. Some people. Uh, say it's the balkanization of the internet. So there's one net whole and free is falling apart into different subnets. I don't like, like balkanization because I think when I think of the Balkans, I think of nice food, great weather, and, and nice people. So I would <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I uh, prefer to, to say nationalization or seg segmentization um, of the internet. You got the halal internets, you got RUNET as the Russian segment of the internet. Many post-Soviet countries are talking about their national segment of the internet. So how does that relate with free, free, flow, free flow of information um, or different subnets? Hate speech, another issue. What is hate speech? What is, what is just unwanted speech, harmful speech, illegal speech? And once it might be illegal, child pornography, for example, is something that's illegal everywhere in the world. So, but once something is illegal, what do we do with it? Do we shut down the service? Do we filter it? Do we block it? So this also has um, uh, consequences for the free flow of information. Privacy, of course, is an issue. Um, now with the PRISM and NSA revelations, surveillance of internet users, of course, becomes a totally new dimension, um, which, by the way, is a little bit difficult to address in all these governments, um, uh, 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 governance, um, surroundings because they basically get a waiver to work around it or to be on top of it or to be outside it. So it's, it's hard to, to govern secret services or NSA or surveillance if they get a waiver to, to circumvent normal regulation anyway. And then in the end, the question is, what's the relevance of all this if the internet becomes private? If there is everything, all communication from the umbrella revolution to Euromaidan in Ukraine or the Arab Spring is taking place on the internet, that's true, but only on the servers of Facebook, Twitter, and Google. So it's not the public internet. What if all communication moves from the public internet to private hosters, to private services, to private um, companies like Google with YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the like? And that's 
of course, only some of the issues um, that shows that freedom of expression on the Internet uh, is endangered or the free flow of information on the Internet is endangered by, by quite a couple of different things um, or issues. Um, some of them technical, some, some of them even good legislation. I mean, legislation with a legitimate aim, but with unintended side effects on, on the free flow of information, like blocking and filtering, for example. So the technical process or the technical progress has changed a lot of these phenomenons on the internet, um, but the underlying quest, uh, the the underlying principles, uh, you could argue, st still stay the same, even though it's kind of old. It's a, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the um, United Nations, um, stemming from 1948. Um, this already guarantees that everyone has the right to freedom of expression and opinion of expression on the internet. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regard, uh, regardless of frontiers. So I always think it was very far-sighted by the UN uh, General, Assembly, General Assembly to already include the Internet in Article 19. Because what else would they mean with any media regardless of frontiers if not the Internet? So that, that was very far-sighted. Um, as I said, you, you should expect that these principles also uh, hold true for the Internet. But then again, working for the OSCE, working in these international uh, surroundings, I was always surprised how many countries um, suddenly want to renegotiate this basic human right on the Internet, which say, well, that, that's true for, for freedom of expression if you're just talking to people, like the speaker's corner concept of, of just to speak. But on the Internet, it's a little bit different. On the Internet, we need licenses. We need national segments of the Internet. So, so the attempts to reno uh, renegotiate um, this fundamental right by quite a number of countries um, or in the name of national security, uh, public order um, is, is really uh, surprising. Anyway, what all this shows is um, that the internet is not free by nature, but by design. So we all know since Lawrence Lessig that code is law. So the way that the internet is set up on a technical level, on a regulatory level, on a policy level, it, it doesn't, it's not nature's law. So it doesn't fell from the, didn't fell from the sky and there it was and it was whole and free. But, but the way it is today was is a matter of design and, and uh, many different stakeholders who designed the internet the way it is. And as we also know from last week's talk by Sean, but also from, from our own experience or, or literature, that the internet, as we learn to cherish it here in the West, in democratic rule of law countries, um, that's not the only way an internet could look like. I mean, if you take a look at China, if you take a look at Saudi Arabia, um, Iran, uh, other countries, you see that they still have something that might look and feel like the internet a little bit, works on the same protocols, works on the same technology, but it's totally different from what we have here or what, what democratic uh, countries um, have. Um, and as I said, it, it's a many different, different stakeholders that are involved in this, uh, sometimes with contradicting um, interests and sometimes just not knowing what the others are doing. Um, if you develop technology, you can say, well, that's just a value-neutral uh, set of technology or of code that I have here. But uh, all these things do influence the way the Internet can be used and might have unintended side effects, as I said. So there needs to be more discussion among different stakeholders, among civil society, governments, technical community, maybe academia, um, to, to really see how we would like the internet to look like. Another thing that was happening um, was that the internet um, was becoming a, a common um, utility basically throughout the world. There are still some access problems in developing countries, of course. There is slow connectivity in parts of the world. But compared to 10 or 20 years ago, the internet is everywhere and, and uh, usage really grew. And it also changed the way um, that we produce content and that we share content. Suddenly, it's not only the media anymore, the mass media, like television, radio, newspapers. But suddenly, it's we, the media, or the, the people formerly known as the audience uh, that are able to share content um, just like, like traditional mass media could 
and they can reach a quite large audience too. So um, that's something that changed with, of course, with the advent of Facebook, of the Twitters and YouTubes of the world, where you can suddenly produce your own TV programs basically free of charge without any technical, uh, with little technical knowledge, sorry, and um, uh, distribute them to, to mass audiences. And not only at this point in time, but um, at the latest, governments became interested, of course. They, they wanted to regulate, they wanted to have a say in this funny academic network and this nerdy thing that was, there was. Once it was, uh, became um, available to the masses and to communication, governments wanted to have their, their say in this. You can see early um, censorship um, uh, measurements, blocking and filtering. Uh, most of the time they were a little bit behind technological, but they were catching up fast with the development of the internet. And um, sometimes, as I said, there was also well-meaning legislation that had those unintended side effects. So the internet suddenly, um, there was the question how to govern the internet, how to rule, how to regulate the internet, and who has a say in this. Um, traditionally, the internet developed a little bit outside the traditional governmental structures you had in radio frequencies or television and satellite frequencies, which were governed by international bodies like the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. Um, it basically was a one-man show or a couple of people from academia and the technical um, community developing the internet, making it function on the principle of rough, rough consensus running code. So whatever worked was fine. And in one of the early manifests of the internet, um, they said, we reject kings and governments. We believe in rough consensus running code. So a totally non-top-down approach to media or to, to this technical infrastructure and a totally bottom-up approach, whatever works is fine. Um, as long as there is some general consensus on this, we, we go ahead. Um, as I said, one-man shows or, or some people uh, like Wind Surf or John Postel uh, of ICANN and Jana um, assigned all those top-level domains. They single-handedly had this list of countries, which today lead to these things of Catalonia or Wales being not included in this list, drawing from international treaties, but, but they basically implemented all, all these things. Um, national governments then wanted to have a say in this. They wanted to have regulation too. They wanted to, to have their say in this. But of course, the industry too. They said, well, it's our cables, it's our networks, it's our servers, it's our software. So, so we, we are basically free to do whatever we want to do with it. And of course, civil society said, well, no, there is this right to freedom of expression, and we make use of it, and we use the internet more than you ever did, and, and we make it, made it work. So um, just leave us alone. Just, just uh, leave it to, to the technical guys. Uh, we don't want governments here. Um, we, we, are, we are pretty fine the, the way we are at the moment. And as you can tell, all these different stakeholders had different interests um, that sometimes were contradicting, um, that sometimes couldn't be brought un under one agreement um, because they were really diverse. Um, on the international level, this could be seen too, of course. And um, there was this concept then developed of a multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance. So that was the idea that was developed at a United Nations uh, summit, United Nations conference in 2003 and 2000, 2005 in Geneva and Tunis. Um, the World Summit on the Information Society was organized. Two places, two years, um, with involvement somehow of civil society, but basically governmental um, conference. And one of the outcomes was in the so-called Tunis Agenda to establish the UN Internet Governance Forum, or IGF. Uh, and this IGF is a so-called multi-stakeholder conference, um, meaning that um, Internet governance is the development and application by governments, the private sector, and civil society. There you have all of them again in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the Internet. So the UN Secretary General um, was tasked to set up this Internet Governance Forum um, to further discuss all these um, governance things. 
The IGF held annual meetings uh, since 2006. Um, I attended a couple of them. I was in Athens at the first meeting. Um, and then there was one in Rio de Janeiro a couple of years ago in Baku in 2012. Um, last year was Bali. Uh, this year, Istanbul. I couldn't go to Istanbul because I was here, but Laura was kind enough to share some of her experiences there. Um, so you have these annual meetings um, bringing together all different stakeholders. Um, the next and the 10th um, IGF is taking place in Brazil, uh, November next year. So whoever wants to go uh, should go there, either as part of the technical and academic community, civil society, or a government delegation. Those are the stakeholders involved. Running up to these IGFs, there are open consultations. Um, it's, uh, they are taking place in Geneva um, several times per year. And they are discussing the outcomes um, of the previous IGFs and preparing the next IGFs, uh, preparing the agenda, um, preparing topics that should be discussed, um, deciding on which workshops uh, will be accepted for the IGF. There is regional meetings, for example, the Eurodig, uh, like the title somehow sounds weird, but it's the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, and you have other regional meetings that then again um, prepare agenda items um, for, for, for the uh, IGF. Um, you've got the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, or the MAC, um, that is um, also advising um, the, organ the organization committee on, on the agenda, on possible workshops and topics. Uh, you got dynamic coalitions formed at the uh, IGF, and you got a couple of other things there. So it's a highly complex building, uh, being around for a decade now, um, d d always changing a little bit in, in shape, in, in, uh, um, in design, in, in agenda, and um, also in the stakeholders involved. Um, no, nobody is really, or at least just talking about me, I'm, I'm still, having been there three times, having worked on that for 10 years, I'm still not so sure what all, all of these bodies are doing, what their exact role is, um, how these <coughs> workshops come about, um, how their nominations for the multi-stakeholder advisory group are open now until the 20th of October. So have somebody nominate you for, for this MAC and then let me know how these nominations are dealt with. So. Um, it, it's a weird animal, and it, it's changing shape all of the time. What, what, one of the, what I thought in the beginning, one of the nice things of the IGF were those dynamic coalitions I, I mentioned here. Dynamic coalitions are ad hoc working groups made up of different stakeholders, so governments, international organizations, civil society, technical community, dealing with a specific topic of internet governance. There was the dynamic coalition on openness. There is the dynamic coalitions on um, basic human rights on the internet. There was the dynamic coalition on freedom of expression online. And I don't know, a dozen or so of these um, dynamic coalitions. They are formed ad hoc, so there is no vetting process or something. You can just, if you have a number of, of people or a number of stakeholder groups, um, you can form those dynamic coalitions. Those dynamic coalitions then can organize workshops within the IGF and further internet governance and, and uh, try to, to have the results of their discussions be included uh, in the closing documents of the IGF. And that's all basically um, at the end of those IGFs, the closing document is what is left there. So the IGF was on purpose or was purposely the, um, uh, created as a non-decision-making uh, body. So the IGF is not making decisions. It's non-binding all the discussions that take place there. Um, each year at the closing session, all those workshops that have been an IGF meeting, an annual meeting is normally three to four days. So all workshops that have been taken place there are reporting back to the closing session. And then you have this huge um, uh, closing document, uh, um, or this, this report from the IGF, where all the findings of all these different groups are included. And then comes the next annual meeting of the IGF. Um, I'm sounding a little bit um, cynical, maybe, but um, after 10 years or after a decade now of those IGFs, I truly have the feeling that it came to a standstill somehow. In the, in the beginning, I was um, thrilled that there is this, under the 
auspices of the United Nations, this multi-stakeholder uh, conference, where civil society and all the other stakeholders can uh, participate in their own right. So they are not part of a national delegation, as it used to be before. So if civil society, if NG NGOs wanted to participate in those international meetings, they usually were part of a national delegation. So they were invited by a government to, to be there. Now for the first, so for one of the first times, they could, they could participate in their own right. Um, however, as I said, after a decade, I think the IGF somehow came, came to a standstill. Um, it's increasingly difficult to find host countries for the IGF, and you add, end up with countries like Turkey uh, this year, which ranks high on the list of reporters without borders as an enemy of internet freedom. Uh, Bali, actually, I'm not too sure about. Um, um, Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, has not the best record when it comes to freedom of expression and internet freedom. Um, the <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That's the question, whether they want to have some of the glory of the IGF just, just uh, uh, glowing on them and to, to somehow correct their record. Um, sometimes they fail. Um, th that's a picture I took at the IGF in, in Baku, um, where one um, freedom of expression uh, NGO um, provided these brochures, the right to remain silent on freedom of expression in Azerbaijan. They were banned from the premises and the brochure was removed, of course. Um, there was also um, allegations that when the president of Azerbaijan opened the IGF, the Wi-Fi connection was cut. I can't really confirm that because Wi-Fi was really spotty the whole <laughs> conference. So having an internet conference without internet is also something that, that infrastructure-wise is a little bit complicated. There, there was at the premises of this conference hall, there was an internet cafe with neither internet nor coffee. <laughs> so that there was also, so I don't know. <laughs> Apparently, it's increasingly difficult to find countries. And if you find countries, um, they, they are not on the forefront of, of freedom of expression online. Um, there, there are civil society organizations like cyberrights.org um, that boycott. Um, IGF meetings like this year in, in Istanbul because of these implicit contradictions of freedom of expression in a country that doesn't respect freedom of expression, um, that, that filters and blocks uh, journalists, uh, websites that, that imprisons uh, bloggers. Um, so there have been boycotts. There also have been, I, I don't know much about it, the Ungovernance Forum this year in Istanbul, so a parallel event um, uh, basically set up against the IGF. That's one of the reasons I think um, the IGF process is slowing down a little bit. But the other one is that there is um, a number of parallel um, conferences taking place at the moment. There is the IGF, 10th year next year, the 9th IGF this year. And then there has been Net Mundial in Brazil, uh, Brazil um, this year in Sao Paulo, organized by invitation of the Brazilian government, also a multi-stakeholder event. Um, also with government um, participation. Um, if you so wish somehow an IGF without UN, some people say it's a, it's a good way forward because you ju just uh, have this, this new energy and, and you bring, it's more civil society based and, and so it's a good way ahead. Um, other actors, um, governmental actors like the European Commission, they criticized the, the Net Mundial for duplicating efforts of the IGF and for distracting the, the uh, process of internet governance um, discussion. So they, they have a quite good um, closing doc document or those freedom of expression principles on the internet, which as a document is, is good, I think. It has been, some people say or criticize it for being a uh, consensus on a very low level um, between governments, industry, and, and uh, civil society. Some people say it's a step ahead. Anyway, this document has to prove uh, itself over time and geography. So, I mean, pa paper is always patient, so we need to see how that works out. Another conference was um, the WCIT, the World Conference on International Telecommunications, organized in Dubai. Again, one of those places with um, not a so brilliant um, freedom of expression uh, record organized by ITU. So suddenly, um, the ITU, which was a little bit out of the loop when the internet was created, 
then had a say in the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005, um, and then being a participant of the IGF, um, which was created on after their summit, they suddenly started their own conference again. They started their governmental conference again, um, non-multi-stakeholder, so there again civil society and NGOs were only be allowed as part of national delegations, not in their own right, and um, they wanted to, to uh, redefine the ITRs, which is national, the International Telecommunications Regulations, which sounds like a very technical protocol or a very technical regulation, but civil society was concerned this, that those technical regulations do have effects on the free flow of information, and there have been uh, many complaints by civil society, but also by some of the ITU member states. So, for example, the US sent a delegation of, I don't know, 40 people there, I think, quite huge and uh, tried to prevent um, the outcome that was um, hoped for by other countries like Russia, like China, like Saudi Arabia. Um, and in the end, the WCIT basically ended with a meager paper that so far um, doesn't really have an effect and most of all does not, does not um, uh, limit freedom of expression in any way. There were things like preventing spam and filtering emails that raised the concerns of civil society. That's just the pretext of limiting the free flow of information. Um, so th that's been out in the final document. But nevertheless, the ITU suddenly um, organized a conference outside the multi-stakeholder uh, process, which they have been a founding part in. So. Governments, too, are suddenly starting their own coalitions um, hosted by or, or on initiative by the Dutch government. There is the Freedom Online Coalition, which is made up of um, 23 governments, 23 countries um, that share the idea that the Internet should be a place for free expression. So um, they have high-level conferences uh, in Estonia, in the Netherlands, and other places where foreign ministers go. So at the IGF, the national delegations is maybe a whatever uh, undersecretary of something or just the head of the telecommunication agency of a country. Um, so that, that's the highest level of, of um, government delegations at the IGF. In this Freedom Online Coalition, suddenly you have foreign ministers meeting. So again, a parallel structure uh, with a good cause. I mean, I like freedom of expression on the Internet. They do too, so nothing against it. But still, it's a parallel uh, development there. You're saying all these are parallel to the IGF, so or positing the IGF as a kind of er thing. I, I can't see them contributing to the IGF. So um, they, they are, it's unclear. I mean, they, they, they are not part of the IGF. Um, some of them are clearly um, establishing themselves as net mundial, as an opposition to the, or an alternative to the IGF. I mean, same set of a conference, same aims. Um, some of them are, like the WCIT, um, more government-based. Freedom Online Coalition, I don't know. So it's governments who want to do something. Maybe they contribute to the IGF, but I haven't seen that too much. So I think it's quasi-parallel. Quasi um, not, not necessarily contradictory, like the Freedom Online Coalition. I mean, they, they can contribute to the IGF. Mm, was that the question? Mm? And also industry is increasingly um, uh, getting on board this whole international internet governance process. So uh, basically, at all, inter at every international conference, IGF, whatever uh, there is, on internet freedom, internet governance, Google is organizing one of their big tent events, that's side events that had nothing to do with the conference as such, but it's just by coincidence taking place at the same time in the same city and the same people are invited. Mm, quite high level conferences. Um, at the Google big tent event um, uh, on the side of the meeting of the Freedom Online Coalition, those 22 countries in The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was the keynote speaker in the Google tent. So they, it's quite high-level um, uh, events that are, that are organized by, by industry, most prominently Google, but, but others too. So you have this abundance of clubs and coalitions of multilateral and, and uh, multi-stakeholder um, approaches to Internet governance. Uh, many of them 
claiming that they want to guarantee uh, freedom of expression on the internet. So basically, it should be settled, and basically, there shouldn't be a problem. You could expect with this um, number of, of people working on it. Um, actually, it isn't, of course. I mean, we see uh, violations of freedom of expression on the internet. We see limits to the free flow of information uh, internationally. We have those talks, like uh, Putin. Uh, President of Russia saying the internet is a CIA project and we need to have our own country's uh, internet to, to um, uh, counter, counter this um, thing. Um, so it is far from perfect in spite of all these initi initiatives going on. Um, and I would like to, I think there is many reasons for this, but I would like to uh, suggest uh, three reasons for this standstill or for this lack of development uh, in this regard. One is cluelessness. I think still um, many people might agree on the problems. Sometimes they don't even agree on the, on the problems uh, ahead. But if they agree on the problems, um, they, they don't know what to do about it. And there is different approaches to it. And uh, there is just um, uh, man, many stakeholders aren't so sure uh, how to go about it. Um, and the question is whether these international conferences are addressing the most relevant topics. As I said, um, the European Commission just recently um, criticized ICANN for discussions about the dot wine top level domain. I don't know whether that's the most pressing issue at the moment when it comes to internet governance. So I think the, the top, the domain name system, those numbers so that you can find your website, that's still important. But domain names, I mean, when was the last time uh, you really entered a domain name? And I mean, don't mean in the Google search window, but in the bra so I think this whole top level domain uh, thing is maybe not the most relevant topic to, to be discussed. Nevertheless, is it, nevertheless, it is discussed and on a quite high political level. I mean, the European Commission is, yeah, they, they, they are limited what they can address in their time, and I don't know whether that's the best um, way ahead. The other reason is that there is simply no consensus. So even if you agree on the problems ahead and uh, even if you see um, uh, that there should be something done, um, to guarantee freedom of expression, there is just no consensus on how to go ahead, at least not on the global level. Um, so it isn't a lack of more conferences or it isn't um, a matter of streamlining the IGF or, or having uh, a different setup of these conferences, um, that there is just no consensus uh, on a global level on many of these issues. And as I said, recent revelations about PRISM and the NSA uh, uh, and internet surveillance by the five eyes, not only the US, but, but also others. Um, Germany was just criticized for eavesdropping on the phone of the Turkish prime minister, so which also put us in a complicated <laughs> perspective there. Um, that, that's also <laughs> things that contributed to uh, an, in, an increased distrust between the stakeholders, between governments, between civil society, and also between industry who might or might not have backdoors implemented in their servers, might share information uh, with prosecution agencies or, or um, secret services. So consensus is a matter um, that can't be solved by, by establishing more conferences or inviting other people to these conferences like Nin Mundial did. But also another point I think that it's important is that as I um, showed you before, the definition of internet governance is that all these stakeholders, civil society, technical community, governments, um, participate in their respective roles and responsibilities. And I think they don't. They go there to the IGF and pretend to be IGF participants. So for the civil society, it might not really make a difference. Or for them, it's the most positive outcome because they are suddenly participating in international conferences that they weren't be able to do before. So in their own right, not part of a national delegation. Uh, industry is going there. I mean, they, they, of course, want to be heard, and they want to have their say. So they go to the IGF, attend side events, um, have their um, talking points. But the real lobbying still takes place in the antechambers of Washington, of Brussels, of Berlin. Um, they are just there because they don't want to miss it and organize their own high-level event on the site because they can. Civil society can't have Secretary of State at their event. Google apparently can at the moment to have Secretaries of State there. And governments or national delegations go there 
and pretend to be civil society. So they participate in the IGF, they discuss the issues um, on a medium level, some head of a telecommunication agency perhaps, or an undersecretary or de deputy undersec assistant secretary of state or something, and that's it. And then they, get, they go to the open consultations and they prepare the next IGF, but there is little follow-up communication beyond the IGF and all these other MACs and dynamic coalitions and open consultations that you have in this biosphere around the IGF. So um, governments, um, I think, sometimes skeptical about governments and, and being libertarian, I don't think they should really regulate the internet, but governments have a role to play when it comes to regulation and, and uh, legislation, and that they just don't do. They participate in the IGF and then they go home and go to the next IGF. So um, I think that's one, one of the, the problems here. Um, Maybe just briefly, um, some perspectives on, on, on the way ahead, on, on the way the whole IGF um, or the internet governance um, discussions on a global level uh, can continue. Uh, one could be to um, maintain the status quo, just to have the IGF in the 10th year next year and then to renew the mandate for another five or 10 years and to continue with the IGF as it is. Um, I think that might be, um, I mean, it, it's a probable way ahead, but I think looking from a freedom of expression perspective, that might not really help because as we see, there is no real results from the IGF. And um, as the WCIT, the ITU government conference shows that um, as soon as there's some leeway for other conferences, governments are stepping in with a more um, top-down regulation approach with a less multi-stakeholder approach. So um, just, just doing Continuing the way it is, I think, um, won't foster um, the cause for, uh, won't, won't uh, um, guarantee freedom of expression online. You could have more parallel fora. Um, like we heard yesterday, uh, it might be let a thousand flowers bloom, or it might be just distracting the process because you have too many duplications and too many fora. Um, taking place in remote places, by the way. So, I mean, governments don't have a problem to travel to Bali, Istanbul, Baku, Athens, and Rio de Janeiro. Civil society might have. So that's also maybe a way just to, to out-travel civil society, if you so wish. It could be that um, we see a um, renewal of national legislation. So the whole internet as a global communication infrastructure uh, might be history and we have the RUNET and the HALALNET and the Chinese internet and um, many different versions of, of the internet or many different national legislation that, that really hinder the free flow of information. Um, you might have a UN oversight of the internet. Many stakeholders and many actors at the moment are discussing the future of ICANN, this Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which at the moment is basically US with international um, it, it has become more international than it used to be in the beginning, but somehow many non-US governments see it as that's too, too American, that's too United States, we need to have a say in that, maybe on a UN level. So that's discussions taking place at the moment. If you allow me a personal note, I've been um, uh, dealing enough with international organizations and UN and all these things, so I don't want the internet to be ruled by an international UN agency. I think it's, it's just slow, ineffective, and, and not, not to the best um, ends when it comes to free flow of information. Or, and that's something um, that I also um, suggest in my blog post that, that has been uh, published um, today, is that um, guarantees, legal guarantees of freedom of expression on the internet should be set um, through international governmental organizations. And here, picking up again that so far, governments are going to the IGF as normal participants. They should go there as governments and take their responsibility as legislators, as lawmakers. Um, there are established um, international organizations that guarantee human rights. Um, you have the OSCE, you have the Council of Europe, um, you have others in other parts of the world. Um, I picked the Council of Europe um, as an example um, because uh, they are made up of 47 European states, but the conventions they have are open for ratification by also non-members. So whoever, whichever country wants to sign into one of their conventions, uh, to one of the human rights conventions, is free to do so, and that suddenly then would, would uh, that, that would be a way 
to um, if you have a group of countries that might agree on solutions or on principles of freedom of expression online, uh, would um, uh, have a, a convention prepared by the Council of Europe with a multi-stakeholder input by civil society, by governments, and in the end it's open for ratification and then might prove its grounds if you see how many countries uh, would actually ratify it. If they ratify it, then it's good. If not, then well, it might be worth a try. And if you take a look at the Freedom Online Coalition with those 23 members, I mean, that's even more signatories as the additional protocol on hate crimes on the internet has at the moment, for example. So that, that might be a way ahead that I would like to suggest and open to discussion maybe. Um, it's a governmental approach so um, to hum guaranteeing human rights, uh, but maybe it's worth thinking about um, for a moment. So thanks for your time and attention until here. So if you have questions or is there's uh, room for discussion, I think, for the next 10 minutes. So if you have questions, please fire away. And thank you. <laughs> or comments or yes, please. There you go. How was that? Uh, you're sick last year. Mm -hmm. Sean, I don't know if I mentioned you or not. Wolfgang. Yeah, Kleinwächter. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this issue of the uh, the top level domain names came up where you have Amazon and company trying to register that Amazon also the Patagonia thing that went away. Yeah. Um, how do you see it? Internet governments playing a role when you have companies that you mentioned like Google having their side side events that parallel these conferences or these forums where obviously there's some influence there money wise and policy wise. How do you how do you think countries can really uh, control things that happen in their border? So to say what would that be? That that that's um I mean, the top-level domains, it's an interesting um, debate when it comes to also dot .africa or dot .catalonia, when, when it, I mean, on, on a um, uh, solely uh, commercial level, I think it, it's, they should do whatever they want, whether it's dot .amazon or, or dot .wine. So I don't see the problem there. Um, having industry organizing their own high-level side events, um, well, I think that, that um, contributing to the discussion, it's important that all stakeholders are on board. So um, they maybe should do so within the IGF. If you would agree that the IGF might be the right forum for these discussions, you shouldn't water it down by, by establishing all these side events and side conferences, but, but join forces to really um, uh, forward issues at the IGF. If you agree that it's the right place, apparently many people don't agree that it's the right place and they have the better idea and the better solution to, to uh, process these things. Um, when it comes to the control of, of content or of the free f or the flow of information on the internet within the national borders, I would uh, say that the question whether you want to control it or not. I mean, um, Article 19 says freedom of expression acro across borders regardless of frontiers. So that's the approach I would follow. So I think it, it, it's not the... The aim shouldn't be to control what comes in and what comes out of your country, but the aim should be to guarantee that it f freely flows across borders. So, again, if you agree to that, um, then there should be guarantees. If you disagree, then you need to find ways on to limit this free flow of information, like Saudi Arabia or like China have been doing. So it's possible. It's just just a question which alternative you prefer. So, Christian, if you go back to that other slide, so you're saying the UN should not have a role in dealing with technical standards, but there should be a role for international bodies guaranteeing legal rights. Are you kind of arguing for a certain types of bodies should have control over certain aspects of the internet and not other, so it should just be like a multi-governing structure of... Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think that that would be... Um, a viable solution, or the other way around. I don't see, the ne see a need to change that much when it comes to the technical governance of the internet. Um, the of course, there's always room for improvement. So, and they did improve in the past. I mean, there is more international um, uh, participation there in their government advisory council. I think is the name for for this GEC for the, the their um, advisory body. 
Um, there have been there has been the announcement by the um, United States government to um, get rid of ICANN or to, to uh, transfer ICANN oversight to a more international level before the end of next year. So there is room for improvement, um, certainly. But um, I was once quoted uh, with a sentence, uh, I like ICANN, that was catching everybody's attention and that, that made the headlines of the conference paper and everything. But, but I would still say it again. So I don't really see the problems with ICANN. I think it works quite well. The internet as it has developed in the past 10 or 20 years. I like it. And it's a, it's, it's a success story. So the, the, there is room for improvement, but I don't know um, whether it would really help the technical development, um, access to the internet, the openness of the internet, or freedom of expression if you transfer ICANN functionalities to a UN body, a new body or the ITU, because that would open the way for governments of more restrict with more restrictive approaches to, gov uh, to, to uh, freedom of expression to have a say in internet governance. So I don't, I don't see the need there, and I rather see a danger that, that it would open ways to more restrictive approaches. Um, well, the UN, though, is so ineffective in general. If you just dummy house ICANN over there, it might just be it's fine, right? Nothing, nothing, there's a possibility that nothing would happen to ICANN. It would not be a backdoor for government. Mm, yeah, my, 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 of course, might be, but that's not what, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't use that as a strategy to say, well, they don't accomplish anything, give it to them. It, it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> so that, that wouldn't be the strategy that I would but follow. That is kind of what's happening, though. Yeah, That's but... The path that it's on. Yeah. Then again, yeah, you could, uh, as I argued uh, also in my presentation, that um, matters of ICANN at the moment maybe aren't the most relevant matters when it comes to internet governance and freedom, guaranteeing freedom of the human right of freedom of expression online. So top-level domains or whatever is maybe not the most pressing issue. Right. So give it away. Why not? Yeah, it is. It's a bone of contention. Yeah. yeah, it's really the the. the yeah. So uh, one of the major themes of the presentation, the idea of freedom of expression, the challenges of freedom of expression as uh, a point of tension between different approaches to internet governance and different fora that have that are pursuing that freedom of expression as an underlying theme of. Uh, Freedom Online Coalition as a soft power effort for, I think it's up to 27 governments now trying to encourage others to be more supportive yeah. of freedom of expression online. One thing I didn't hear you speak about is the issue of trade and the internet as a, plat as a trade platform and barriers to internet services as a trade barrier. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in your framework for internet governance? Um, okay. Um, of course, there is. That's right, I didn't mention it. Um, th there is different, um, I think, um, implications of, of trade on internet governance or on the free flow of information. Um, some of them relate to freedom of expression, expression and the free flow of information. Some are parallel or don't, don't really. One, one example um, that I think has or might have direct uh, implications on freedom of expression is copyright issues. So um, these um, three strikes and you're out or, or approaches to copyright violations, um, uh, data retention and, and um, uh, identification of internet users for copyright violations. I think that's one of the most concrete um, parts when it comes to, to international trade um, uh, and freedom of, the freedom of expression or the free flow of information. Other things, I mean, at the moment there are discussions about TTIP, the transatlantic um, uh, um, uh, partnership or free trade partnership um, that also um, incorporate issues of cultural identities and, and cultural works um, that, that uh, raise concerns. Um, but you're right, maybe it's worth looking a little bit deeper into that too beyond copyright. I mean, more on a structural level and not only on, on a level where, for example, copyright just in has has the, its ways into freedom of expression, but more on a structural level, how the two relate. Um, I think Google, of course, as you said yesterday in, in the seminar, Google um, believes in the free flow of information because the free, it's necessary for them to, to uh, for the business model. So they they, they want to sell advertisement, and that's easier if it's, the information is, is flowing freely. But then again, I mean, they they do it only as long as it doesn't hurt their business model. 
um, if they suddenly are um, in the danger of being thrown out of a country, then they suddenly pull YouTube content or something. So there, yeah, this is also a relation between business interests and human rights or the privatization of, of censorship. If, if the whole inf um, communication moves to private platforms, it, 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 it um, becomes more important what, what private actors uh, actually saying, or whether it's a matter of corporate social responsibility, what the relation between um, business and human rights is, what the responsibilities of business for the um, uh, implementation of human rights might be. Yeah, definitely worth looking deeper into. Well, maybe, I mean, it's a challenging question. I don't think we need to have answers today, but content control is one pillar of internet governance, including cybersecurity, intellectual property, uh, critical internet resources. I would argue that data retention and cybersecurity is another aspect of, yeah. of, of internet governance. Now, if the normative approach is we should have freedom of expression, then the answer is how do we have a Kyoto agreement for the internet? The other approach would be if the internet is an interdependent system across multiple countries that impacts a wide number of different policy areas, is there a different approach or a framework that respects some types of national authority while supporting a global ecosystem, similarly that we might have a financial regulation or environmental regulation that will approach the internet as a, as a global regulatory commons? Is there a, one of those two approaches you think would be more fruitful? Um, two things you mentioned. One is, of course, um, maybe I should have mentioned it at the beginning, the IGF is not about freedom of expression. It's about internet governance. And as you mentioned, there's opening, in the, I think the, four, the first IGF had four things, openness, security, access, and forgot the fourth. The, the IGF in Istanbul had a list of seven main areas which, which they are looking into. Um, I just picked freedom of expression because I think it's, um, well, it's my, my uh, career background, so to say. Uh, but it's also uh, one of the dimensions that is laid out as a fundamental human right in, in the Universal Declaration. So, so I think it, has, it, it is valid and is, is, is important. Um, the other, that you have national and international regulation, I think it's already the case. I think you, you shouldn't, or that there is not necessarily uh, uh, the need to overcome it, um, but some way of harmonization or um, agreement on a, uh, a minimum level of, of um, free flow. I mean, in the European uh, Union, you had, uh, have these um, minimum consensus um, on content coming from uh, trade, from free trade, not from a human rights perspective. But still, you, you agreed on a minimum. Whatever is legal in one European country is also automatically legal in all other European countries. So you have national legislation, but a uh, minimal consensus on the international level. I think it's possible, and you don't really need to overcome it. I think, I think there is room um, uh, for, for national particularities um, that traditionally developed in classical media, broadcast, radio, what have you. Uh, some of that needs to be adjusted to the internet. Some of that, I think, can just stay in place. As um, the relation between freedom of expression and all the other cybersecurity uh, and these things of um, internet governance or the IGF, I think it's one of the challenges to combine them. So, um, and I would love to see, um, that's biased, of course, but I would love to see um, solutions to cybersecurity implemented that doesn't violate freedom of expression. So that that's a biased approach, but it's the approach that, that I'm following. If you would ask somebody from the, from the security community, I mean, they, they would come from a total, it, within the OSCE, the OSCE is a human rights organization, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the 57 country organization. They deal with human rights, with um, economics, environment, military security, and, and a number of different issues. I was always surprised what we are dealing with it was when I was working them. Um, and there was this freedom of expression uh, office that I was working for, and there was the, um, uh, what were they called, Department Against Cyber Terrorism or something. And we were just so controversial in our argument, coming from the same international organization, being paid from the same governments, working in the same building. I mean, to totally different approaches to the same problem. So I think you, I don't know whether you have to made a, uh, make a choice, but um, I, I would admit that, that I'm taking the pro-freedom of expression uh, approach here. TTIP. TTIP. It's the, help me out here, trans... Trans-Atlantic Treaty Partnership. 
and the I is TTIP. It's the, the transatlantic free trade agreement that's currently under discussion between the EU and, and the US. Hmm. Investment, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.